correspondence. And First Thessalonians just gets four pages in your textbook. But we can say about this church that it was founded in the early AD 50s. You already saw that in your timeline, your chronology on page 237. It was founded on Paul's second missionary journey. And uh, we read about this in Acts 17, 1 through 10. There was a lot of opposition, and there was so much opposition that Paul and Silas had to be sent away by night. And after they left, the believers paid a price for their faith. And I'll read these verses from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse 13. And we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God. Remember I said a while ago, dual, dual authorship? Paul says, we were preaching, but it wasn't just us. What, what we were preaching was God's word. Which is at work in you believers. For you brothers, and in Greek, remember, brothers is inclusive. It means brothers and sisters. Became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. And what he means there is that around Jerusalem, when uh, Jews became Christians, they were, um, they were attacked. They lost their jobs. They were disowned. They suffered. You became imitators of those churches. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they, as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and displeased God and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved so as always to fill up the measure of their sins. But God's wrath has come upon them at last. Well, we won't go into all that except to say, the point is, the Thessalonians paid for receiving the gospel. And, and that's the way it is sometimes. You know, probably all of us, if we were in the United States, we probably didn't get personally attacked when we got serious about the Lord Jesus. Maybe you, maybe you did, but you know, most of the time, you know, it's regarded as your own decision. But in much of the world, if you become a Christian, then you're made to pay for it, sometimes with your life, and that's what happened to the Thessalonians. Now, because they had to leave, because things were so bad, and, and, and let me just remind you here, this is, this is a, a case where, you know, Jesus said, turn the other cheek. You know, and there is a time when we have to be a witness, and it might mean arrest, and it might mean martyrdom. That's what happened to Stephen. All right? And Jesus teaches about that in the Sermon on the Mount. Turn the other cheek. But in Matthew 10, Jesus says, when they persecute you in one city, what? Go to the next. So remember what Ecclesiastes teaches, there's a time for everything. <laughs> there's a time to turn the other cheek, and Jesus teaches that. But there's also a time to move on. And eventually we think Paul was martyred. But, the, you know, I've already mentioned tonight living in, in you know, a, a cruciform life and, and have to, you know, living willing to pay the price of faithfulness to God, but it doesn't necessarily mean that your commitment to God is a suicide pact, and that you're just looking for a place and a way to get punished <laughs> or to get arrested or to offend somebody. And, and, and Paul and Silas here, I don't think they were sinning against God by going away by night. I think this was the leading of the Spirit. And there are times when we make our statement. Uh, Paul was stoned, people thought, to death on the first missionary journey. And that wasn't the first time he was persecuted. So Paul knew what persecution was. Paul was willing to be persecuted. 
But as he preached in Thessalonica, as the opposition grew, the Lord led him and Silas to get out by night. And that's the way it is. Sometimes God spares us and says, move on. And other times God says, you have to take your stand here. And uh, it's going to be terminal this time. But that wouldn't come for Paul for another 15 years or so. In the months after leaving, leaving Thessalonica by night, Paul wrote two letters back to these valiant young believers. Part of what he stressed is last things. How in the end, God's justice will triumph. Those who oppose God will be crushed. This is important to know when you're being crushed by God's enemies. It's very important to know, to have faith in God's ultimate justice. Because sometimes it seems like the wicked are winning, and you can lose hope. But you have to remember, it's not over until God says it's over, and I might die, but that doesn't mean God is not going to make things right. God will put all wrongs right. This is one of our most fundamental convictions as Christians. We believe that in the end, God is just and goodness will prevail. God will prevail, love will prevail, and evildoers will meet their end. And because God's going to put everything right, we can hope in him and live our lives in faith and diligence. And the passage below summarizes Paul's end times perspective. It gives a wonderful cross-section of knowing Christ's future triumph, or of how knowing Christ's future triumph makes the lives of those who follow him new now. There's a lot of ways God gives us hope. And one of the ways he gives us hope is telling us about last things. Now concerning the times and seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. See, I think Paul taught on this when he planted the church. He's reminding them now of what he taught. While people are saying peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. You are children of light, children of the day. We are not of night or of the darkness. So let's not sleep as others do, but let's keep awake and be sober. Those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let's be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not des destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live for him. Uh, by awake, he means living. By sleeping, he means dying. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you were doing. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. That's their ministers, their pastors. And to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. It's hard to be a pastor if people are uh, fighting each other or the pastors. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the fainthearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Notice the coming there. He who calls you is faithful, he will surely do it. Brothers, pray for us. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. I put you under oath before the Lord to have this letter read. To all the brothers, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So a couple of observations here, noting again how much this passage I just read starts out with last things, ends up with last things, kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he's going to give, if you will, ethics and moral uh, reasoning here, but it's framed in terms of the, the return of Christ and judgment in the end. 1 Thessalonians contains 20 commands. That's what I mean there by imperative form verbs. One of them is in 418, but all the rest are in this passage. And I've bolded them. Every one of those bolded letters is a command 
in the original. There are also six virtual imperatives, and I've underlined them. Respect, esteem, uh, let us not sleep, let's keep awake and be sober, let's be sober, have this letter read, and so forth. So based on all these commands, what kind of congregation would you say Paul is dealing with? I mean, all congregations would hear this, but I'll say newer believers. There's a lot of very basic things. <laughs> but people who are new in the faith need to be told the obvious. And so I think that these commands are consistent with a group that's only been in the faith maybe two or three months. In what ways does Paul think they need to stabilize and grow? As you uh, see those commands, does any commonalities strike you? Okay. There are a lot of relational things here. A lot of relational things. Okay. Okay. Very important that the, the spirit is uh, at the core of all this. Anything else? Okay, like minded? Good. Encourage one another, build one another up, be at peace. I think in terms of stabilizing and growing, it's important to pray and be thankful and rejoice. Okay. Very good. Give thanks in all circumstances. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus. So very, some very rich imperatives here, um, and, and this is something I'll, you know, I don't have it in your handout, but especially those who, who are thinking about this, this is, this is signature, this is signature Pauline um, apostolic council. The indicative is the basis for the imperative. Um, by imperative, I mean a command. And for a lot of people, religion is commands. That's why I don't want to go to church. But they either never heard the gospel preached, or they heard it preached, but they didn't hear it right. We're not saved by responding to commands. <laughs> you know, that would be being saved by our obedience. We're saved by what God did on our behalf. We're saved by something God did. And in grammar, when you describe something that is or that happens, we call it that the indicative. If I ask a question, that's the interrogative. If I give a command, that's the imperative. But if I say, Christ died for our sins, that's an indicative statement. If I say, believe in the gospel, that's an imperative. Paul gives lots of commands, but he always lays the foundation of this is what God did. And then on the basis of what God did, I urge you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, 11 chapters of Romans, he's described the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice. When you pick up Romans, it doesn't, you know, Romans 1.1, 1, 1, present your body a living sacrifice. It doesn't start there. 11 chapters in Romans before he ever says anything much about how we should live. And Ephesians is the same way. You get three chapters of theology, and then finally in chapter 4, he starts talking about how to live. And, and this is because Paul knows that we can only live a certain way when we receive the grace of what God has done for us in Christ. Faith comes by hearing. And then once we have a relationship with God that's uh, trusting as you said, then his spirit is part of the mix of our internal life and his spirit can work in us in such a way that not only we're able to do, but as we read from the psalmist, 
how I love your law, O oh Lord. It's liberating to do the things that God says, this is how you will be happy and I will be pleased. It's liberating to live that way. And the indicative of Christ's death for us in his resurrection makes possible all these imperatives. So why does he wait until the end of chapter 4 to begin giving commands? Because he wanted to lay the basis of the indicative. To remind them of what he had preached to them, remind them, praise them, commend them, settle them down, and then right at the end, he said, okay, now, we got the Christ thing, we got the sanctification thing, we got the uh, providence thing, you're in God's hands, we got the justice thing, God will take care of your enemies. Now, this is what, this is how you should respond to God. This is how you should live. This is how you should care for each other. And he, he gives them the commands. Um, number two, if sanctification or holiness means different or separated or distinct from, and it generally does, how do verses 1 through 11 promote holiness? <coughs> One summary here would be uh, to look at verse 9. God has destined us to obtain salvation. He has set us apart. We've, we've heard the word. We've received it. We are a people. And uh, there are a lot of answers, I think, to that question. But these verses promote holiness by giving us a consciousness of being God's people. They promote a different kind of life because we have a different kind of consciousness. We're aware that we're not like everybody else. I mean, that's one reason we probably come to church on Sunday morning. We don't come to church on Sunday morning so we can go to heaven. I mean, there are a lot of reasons we go to church on Sunday morning, but, but a fundamental reason is because we just know that's what we need to do because we're part of the family of God. And we know from the teaching of Scripture, and we know from experience, that God's people crave fellowship with each other and worship of God. And of course, if you are a member of this church, you have a distinctive form of worship. You have certain kinds of music. You have certain kind of liturgy. You have certain kind of preaching. You know, and different churches do that different. But the commonality is that people come and they express a certain identity. They are God's people. Maybe they say a creed. Maybe you say the Lord's Prayer. Maybe you sing certain kind of hymns. And week by week you celebrate and you express and you renew through a refreshing of your identity as God's people. And this is what Paul is doing in these 11 verses. When you look at those verses, you know, he's contrasting them as children of light with the people around them as children of darkness. And how they're living their lives oblivious to what's going to happen someday. God's going to judge the earth. Uh, they are ready for the return of the Lord. He's not going to catch them like a thief uh, is in the night. Uh, they're going to be ready for the Lord's return. So they have a different identity. Note also the references to the Holy Spirit. He's a different spirit. He infuses into God's people the character that he calls on them to exude. And the Thessalonian readers are distinct. They're holy in all kinds of ways, but I kind of read through this passage and picked out the things that he says of them that are the result of their receiving the gospel. If you receive the gospel and you study it and you learn to pray and you learn the word of God, then you become increasingly savvy, aware, not hypnotized by the culture. You know, everybody else is saying peace and security, everything's okay. No, you know better than that. You're not in darkness and cluelessness. You're enlightened. 
You're proactive in alertness and sobriety. You're prepared. You're assured. You're expectant. You're engaged. Part of your savviness and awareness is you are bearing up others, and you're being borne up by others. And this is all part of the ministry of the Holy Spirit to you and of your ministry to others in the Holy Spirit. And right there at the end, it's just uh, so wonderful to be part of bearing other people up, but also to be borne up by other people. Because we, we all need both things. You know, we need to be borne up, but uh, we also need the, um, the exertion, but also the reward of, of you know, encouraging other people. And uh, you probably lived some of your life not being very encouraging to many people. You know, we go through those patches. But hopefully many of you know. And, and for some of you, this may be 90% of your life. You may be living it for other people, encouraging other people. And, and you're fine with that. How much of Jesus' life did he spend for, uh, living for himself? Very little. You think he, you think he was like twisted or sick or masochistic or something? No. <laughs> he understood why a human is on this earth. A human is on this earth to glorify God, and uh, that often translates into caring for others. And uh, he found a peace in that, and he said, my meat and my drink is to do the will of the one who sent me. I'd rather minister than eat. Now, when I get to that point, you can just beam me up, all right? But that's what one of the things Paul is saying here, is that when we receive the gospel, uh, we, we have an identity that makes us one of those people that encourages others and draws encouragement from encouraging. Let's take uh, five minutes and we'll come back and uh, it'll be the home stretch.